Um, people are gonna, you're all gonna die. Uh, nobody in here, maybe except him, is gonna be alive 600 months from now. So there's no question you, you're gonna die. The question is when and how. When is largely predetermined maximum lifespan. You can shorten it, but you're not gonna lengthen maximum lifespan. There's been five people who have passed 117 out of 109 billion modern humans. So the odds of you going past 117 are one in 20 billion right now, somewhat. So the idea isn't that this is about trying to not die. You're gonna die. The question is trying to live until you die, live fully functional. Avoid the 9.6 years of debility and 18 years of ill health that the average person has, where they lose the ability to talk and move and function and care for themselves. They find themselves unable to talk or move, lying in some nursing home bed waiting for people to come and change their diaper. That's what we're talking about, is trying to maintain a high degree of independent functionality until you reach your genetic potential. Some people have strong genes, they're gonna live a long time. Other people, even if they take care of themselves, may not necessarily live as long. That, you can't change your genes, you can't change predisposition, and you can't really change luck that much. But what you can change are the 10 most important things in order to get and stay healthy, and that's what we're gonna talk about briefly here. Number one on our list of 10 most important things is avoiding drugs and chemicals. Avoiding drugs and chemicals. Now that includes things like drugs, like caffeine, alcohol, recreational drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and as much as possible, prescription drugs, because chemicals, both from the ones we take voluntarily and exposed to in the environment, like pesticides, herbicides, and compounds, contaminants, molds, these things, were not present in concentrated form through most of our ancestral history. There's never been any evolutionary pressure to select humans that had a good ability to deal with chemical exposure and filter out those that didn't. So you don't know what your threshold is to any one of these given chemicals. You might have a real good tolerance, or you may not. You don't know where it's gonna push it over the edge and you start uh, um, spreading the living cancer cells secondary to excess exposure. The best strategy is to try to avoid the exposure to these chemicals that you don't have any normal or natural historical relationship to. And that's why it's number one on the list. Now some things are obvious. Don't smoke. Don't breathe other people's smoke. Don't drink alcohol. Don't use caffeine. A highly addictive nervous system drug that we put in the, in the candies and, and things we give to kids. It's, it's really insane when you think, look at caffeine and how powerful an addictive drug it is. Over-the-counter meds and prescription drugs, even these commonly used over-the-counter medications, are responsible for tens of thousands of premature death and disability. Even Tylenol and these things cause all kinds of kidney disease and damage. You need to avoid those substances whenever possible. Pesticides, herbicides, volatile organic compounds, that means, you know, don't drink municipal water that's not been filtered because you get chlorine that interacts with hydrogen hydrocarbons and creates a mess. Um, don't um, uh, be conscious about trying to maintain hygiene in a home and circulation so you don't have molds and their proteins and other things that are hard on us. The most important way, though, to avoid chemicals and drug exposure besides not smoking and doing obvious things, is number two, adopt a vegan diet. Because it turns out that 90% of the average load of a typical person's chemical toxicity got there from eating animal foods. Animals biologically concentrate the materials from their environment, from their feed, from what they breathe, what they drink, what they eat, what we inject in them. And it builds up in their tissues day after day after week after month, so when you eat an animal, you get its entire lifetime accumulation of biologically concentrated poisons, which is why if you look at animal food, say a calorie of animal food compared to a calorie of, say, plant food, you could have two to a thousand times the concentration of chemicals in the animal food compared to the plant food because the animals are more efficient at biologically concentrated moving the chemicals up the food chain, so to speak. When you put yourself at the top of that food chain and start eating animals, you're getting, that's why 90% of your load is likely got there because of animal food. And the, you know everything else combined makes up the balance of it. Now, if you're a vegan, you're not eating meat, fish, fowl, or very much. You can still get exposed to chemicals, breathing the air, eating non-organic produce, et cetera. So it's still important for you to be dealing with, but at least you've eliminated one of the big uh, behemoths uh, of exposure. The other thing about adopting a vegan diet is it tends to be low in, obviously, no animal protein, lower in sulfur amino acids, so you have less risk of osteoporosis and kidney disease and cancer and all the other stuff. 
has been associated with eating excess animal-based proteins. Number three on the list is avoid the chemicals added to food. And the chemicals that are added to food I'm talking about are SOS. SOS, as you know, is the international symbol of danger. It stands for salt, oil, and sugar. Salt, oil, and sugar are not foods. They are chemicals, that is, concentrated food byproducts that are added to food, particularly federally subsidized grains like corn, soy, and wheat. To fool your brain, to produce more dopamine so you get more pleasure, and that's what, quote, good tasting food is, is more salt, oil, and sugar artificially stimulating dopamine production in your brain, essentially the pleasure trap. And so if you go to a grocery store, you'll find almost all the food isn't whole natural foods, it's grains processed with oil, salt, and sugar into different forms and colors uh, to fool your brain so that you'll like them. And that's what most of the food is. Look at the labels. It's mostly salt, oil, and sugar, and corn, wheat, or soy, or it's animal foods. So we're saying avoid the chemicals added to food, avoid SOS. That means you adopt a whole plant food diet that's salt, oil, and sugar free. Number four on the list is exercise. Did our ancient ancestors have to worry about getting enough exercise? Did they have to join clubs and stuff to make sure? No, they had to exercise by force. That means if they got cold, they had to move. If they got hot, they had to move. If they got thirsty, they had to move. If they got hungry, they had to move. And if they didn't want to get eaten, they had to move. So they moved by, they would have sat around and watched TV if they could have too. But they couldn't. In order to get enough to eat, not get eaten, your ancestors had to exercise. They had to get movement. Um, the ones that didn't died, and they didn't live to reproduce, which means they're not your ancestors. Your ancestors were the winners, not the losers. Think about it. Let's say, let's say your parents weren't winners. Would you be here? No, you couldn't be here. What if your grandparents weren't winners? You couldn't be here. What if your great-grandparents weren't? For a thousand generations, every single one of your ancestral tree got enough to eat, didn't get eaten, and lived to reproduce. If any one of them had faltered, you wouldn't be here. So you're the end result, the piece de resistance of a long chain of successful survival and sexual reproduction. You had characteristics. You had characteristics that you inherited from your parents. Your parents were the ones that got enough to eat, they didn't get eaten, they got their exercise. Exercise allows you to build strength, stamina, flexibility, and balance. So the activities you do are designed to provide a number of different functions. You need strength, so you can carry out functions like getting up. You lose strength in your legs, you can't even get out of the chair. You need flexibility, so you can bend over and pick something up. You need stamina, so that you can walk from here. Like, you know, people nowadays, they're so deconditioned, they can't even walk from their parking lot into the McDonald's. It's too far. So they have to go through the drive-thru, get their 2,000 cars of grease. They've increased sales 40% just by keeping people from having to do that incredibly difficult walk. And then you have to walk back out, too. Oh, my God. Carrying your bag. It's exhausting. You can't walk up and down. The, you know, they get into fights now. Even people going to the exercise club to get the closer parking place because they wouldn't want to walk all the way through. Um, and stress compensation. It turns out people that exercise um, have a better balance in their stress hormones and other things. They adapt to the stresses they can't completely avoid. Now, it also is good to avoid stress, so that means try to, you know, don't read the twit or whatever. You, just, you, know, you don't need to know. Okay. Number five, slip, sleep. Did our ancient ancestors have any trouble with sleeping? Were they, t are they, were they all on Ambien and various? No, because when did they go to sleep? When it got dark and they woke up when it got light, and that's not four hours. They didn't have artificial lights. And what about the ones that like to stay up and party? Were those your ancestors? Did any of your ancestors, were they party people? No. no. The party people all got eaten by the carnivores that are awake at night. Your ancestors were the ones that crawled in the back of some cave somewhere and went to sleep, and if they were lucky, they survived another evening. Okay? You are designed to sleep, to get enough sleep. Healing takes place largely during sleep. If you don't get enough non rem deep sleep, the anabolic cascade of hormones associated with healing doesn't happen. You won't heal as well. You want to sleep in a cool, dark, and quiet place. If you are fatigued, by definition, you didn't get the quality or quantity of sleep, you need to overcome the stresses of the day before. Sure, if you're healthy and you have a low stress life and you eat well, you won't need as much sleep. 
is if you don't, if you meditate, if you do appropriate exercise, you won't need quite as much sleep, but you still need to get enough sleep that you can wake spontaneously feeling refreshed. If you have to wake up and use an addictive drug like caffeine in order to be able to function, you, you're not getting enough sleep. Number six on our list of the most important things you're going to do to get stay healthy, fresh air and sunshine. Did our ancient ancestors ever have to worry about fresh air? It's the only kind of air there was. What about sunshine? No, they lived outside. They got exposed to the sun to form the vitamin D and the hormones and all the things that you need. So if you nowadays, you know, if you live this far north, you may not even be able to make vitamin D half the year. You might have to supplement vitamin D, you know, just in order to keep your blood levels normal. Unfortunately, it's an easy blood test. We do it. All of you are tested if you're low in D, then we'll help get you out in the sun more or so. Social skills. Now, this is a little weird. Why would social skills be on the list of 10 most important issues for getting and staying healthy? It's because Dr. Lyle, he said that it had to be there. <laughs> so it turns out that high self-efficacy about having the skills needed to deal with the three kinds of people you deal with, the people you meet, the people you, you love, and the people you like, is important. If you don't have those skills, you will have a deficit that apparently it compromises your ability to be healthy and happy. So that doesn't mean, for example, you have to have love in your life in order to be healthy or happy. It does mean, though, you have to believe that if the right person came along, you have the skill set necessary to attract and maintain the relationship. So it doesn't necessarily have to be activated at any given moment, but you have to be confident that you have the ability to do that in order to be able to meet your psychological needs. You also have to learn to minimize exposure to energy vampires. Energy vampires are people that do what they do best, and that's make other people as sick and miserable as they are, so by comparison, they don't have to feel so bad. These are the people, especially if you're a woman, you'll meet those at work when after you've been here, you've lost 50 pounds and you go to work, and all the other women at work will not be going, oh, look at you, we're so proud of you. You must have adopted a whole plant food diet. What can we be to do, do to be supportive? Is that what your friends at work are going to be saying when you come back in your thin clothes and perky smile? No, they're going to be going, oh, here she comes, that bitch. Because they know why you lost weight, because you're a mate poaching whore. And they will try to undermine your health. They will, try, they will bring you cupcakes. They will tell you where you can get your protein from. It's not good to be a fanatic. You think you're so good with your thin clothes. You make me sick. <laughs> and they will, they will, it's a problem, I'm telling you. If you're a man, you don't have to worry as much because the other men, well, they won't notice. <laughs> but if they do happen to notice that you lost 50 pounds, they don't care. So you'll have a little bit easier time if you're male. Okay, number eight, nutritional excellence. It turns out, in a natural setting, you'd never have to worry about anything. You'd Especially B12, you get so much fecal contamination from the produce you're eating off the trees and out of the ground, you'd have no trouble with getting B12. B12 comes from, from uh, bacteria, that's it. The problem is, we found out that if you allow yourself to eat a lot of bacterial contaminated foods, you can get parasites and worms and get sick and die. It's not good. So we started to develop hygiene washing, peeling, you know, doing stuff. It has a lot of advantages. One disadvantage is it reduces your bacterial exposure a lot. So much so that over enough years, you can actually develop B12 deficiency unless you're taking a supplement. If you're eating meat, one of the things that's neat about meat is it has tremendous contamination. Meat, especially like ground meat, full of feces, just teeming with fecal contamination. And that fecal contamination is a rich source of bacteria. It can make you sick and it can kill you, but if it doesn't, it does allow you plenty of B12. So if you're a meat eater with all that nice feces, don't worry so much about this. But if you're a vegan and you're not getting all that fecal contamination, that, and you're not in your washing and peeling stuff, so you're not getting the ground up insects and all the other stuff that people would, in a natural setting, get exposed to, eventually, over enough years, you could develop B12 deficiency. That's a problem. It's easily solved, 1,000 micrograms of methyl cobalamin a day. That'll meet virtually everybody's needs. The stuff we've got, it's got, you can take a little capsule that's in a gel, not gelatin, it's a vegan capsule or a liquid, you know, a few drops, no problem. Okay, um, if you live in Minnesota, how many people live in Minnesota? Good, I can tell my Minnesota story. If you live in Minnesota, the oceans have never covered Minnesota. There's no iodine in that soil. So if you ate everything you ate came from Minnesota soils, it would be iodine deficient. 
And so they add iodine to salt because they figure, well, that's the one thing they know everybody's going to get plenty of. But if you're on this diet and you're not adding iodized salt and you ate everything from Minnesota, you'd eventually develop iodine deficiency and get a goiter. So either you get some foods from the coast where there's iodine in the soil and naturally occurs in the food, or you include some sea vegetables like kelp or something in the diet, or, or you supplement iodine. But that's, it's a nutrient that theoretically could be deficient only because plants don't have to have iodine. They have to have most like calcium and magnesium, they have to have all that, but they don't need iodine. So we include a little bit of sea vegetables in the diet. We include foods grown other than in just Minnesota. And so it's not normally an issue. Um, the reason I mentioned Minnesota is because I had a patient from Minnesota here who had been in the state and never left the state her entire life. She was in her mid-70s when she came here. And she came here in the winter and it was like this. Yeah. And it was 40 below. Below. Did you know it goes below? Zero? Yeah. 40 below zero. Mm -hmm. Snow up to the... And she said, oh, that's it. <laughs> She's moving to California. She called up her husband. She said, dear, I've made a decision. We're moving to California. And then they talked to me. She, she, no, no, dear. No, no. You just pack it up. I'm not coming back. <laughs> she said not one more day. <laughs> they moved here. Okay. So, number nine. And the DHA? Oh, yeah, DHA. Decosohexoic acid. You make that yourself from omega-3 fatty acids. So if you get an uh, adequate source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids, most people occur, currently do fine. A rich source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids are nuts and seeds and, and, and uh, green vegetables. Now some people can't eat nuts or seeds because they find their food triggers. If they eat one, they want to eat the whole thing. AJ talks about the fact that if she ate one nut, then she wants to eat the whole thing, and then she you know, can't maintain her weight. So. Um, if you can't eat nuts, maybe you're allergic to them, or you don't want to eat them because you've got food trigger issues, then we would, that's the time we'd have to supplement a vegan source of DHA. And there are, uh, Martech has a product that comes from lichen. It's, an, it's a vegan source of DHA, and that would be an option there. There are some people that don't convert omega-3 fatty acid to DHA really well, particularly peri- and postmenopausal women that have certain enzymatic issues. And there may be a time where if your test low or if you had symptoms that we we're concerned about, your, your attending might recommend DHA supplementation. It's not something that we routinely recommend. Sorry. Um, so there is testing for it? Yes, there is. The controversy is it's, it's not well established what normal levels are. And it's not well established, you know, so interpreting it can be, can be a challenge. But there, are, there is blood testing that measures DHA levels. And you can use that testing if it's extremely low to justify either changing the diet to include source of omega-3 fatty acids or supplementing preformed DHA, which is easy and simple to do nowadays. When you mentioned DHA at a previous talk, you said something, I think you identified some symptoms for uh, post-menopausal women. Real dry know? skin or, or you know, other issues. The big concern is they supplement DHA in infant formula because they found without a supplemental for infant formula is not a natural food for human beings. Mama's milk has plenty of omega-3 fatty acids in it, but cow milk doesn't. And so if they don't supplement, the cognitive development of the children is impaired and they get brain issues. And so all of the baby formulas have this vegan source of DHA supplement in it, okay? And so there are people that believe that vegans don't get enough DHA and therefore everybody should take DHA. Um, the fact is that there's no real evidence that supports that as a general recommendation. So our recommendation is, you can, if you're concerned, we can test for it. If there's symptoms, we can deal with it. Uh, but what we recommend is that you get an ounce of nuts or seeds, particularly walnuts, flax seeds, these really rich sources of omega-3 fatty acid. And unless there's a specific clinical problem, then we wouldn't supplement. It's the same kind of thing with iodine and, and vitamin D. We test for it. If it's low, we'll, we'll deal with it. If it's not low, you know, we prefer to avoid the pills and the potions and the powders and everything else. The one exception, though, is vitamin B12. We believe that vegans should supplement vitamin B12, okay? That the risk of eating fecal contaminated meat far out exceeds the, the non-risk of supplemental B12. Fortunately, B12 is a water-soluble nutrient. If you take too much, you piss it out. You're spending money you don't need to spend, but there's no health you know, downside from oral B12. Um, and what we're talking about is very low doses. 1,000 micrograms of B12 would fit on the head of a pin. I mean, it's a very low dosing 
situation, but much better than you know eating stuff off the ground and getting worms and parasites. It's particularly true now because we want our patients living 80, 90, 100 years. Whereas, you know, if you were going to, in the old days, you're going to die at 35 from predation or starvation or whatever. Maybe it's not as critical an issue, but our patients have to be particularly worried about everything because they're going to live so long that they're going to have risks of developing issues that other people that will be dead from heart disease won't. My mother, when she turned 92 years old, realized that she had outlived all 52 of her lifelong friends. They had all died, many of which were never got off her back about her son's crazy diet and all this stuff that she had been doing. But at 52, she absolutely outlived every single one of them. And she told me, she said, it's a real problem. Because, you know, when you're 92 years old, it's harder to make friends. Because all the people your age, you know, are dysfunctional. And she said, Alan, you need to warn your patients if they're going to do this diet. Make younger friends. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a real serious problem. Um, since we are so clean now as a society, washing our yes. foods and things, um, well, we don't actually. It turns out that you have a thousand different types of bacteria that live in a healthy human vegan gut, and they keep each other in balance as long as you create an environment that allows them to grow and flourish. Now, if you take antibiotics, you can wipe that flora out, and then we need to reestablish it. Some people believe that fermented foods and other things very rich in bacteria are helpful. That's still debatable. It might be. You know, there, there are some evidence that suggests it might be useful. The biggest thing is creating the right internal environment. And we've done a study now with Washington University. We haven't seen the data back yet, which we're waiting on, but it was looking at the changes in the microbiome before and after fasting. What we see clinically is a lot of these problems resolve. What we're assuming we're gonna find is it creates a situation where the normal flora can regrow. We do know that people on vegan diets have a much different bacterial flora than meat eaters. And that appears to be much more favorably supporting of health. And so we think that fasting is gonna turn out to be a way of like rebooting the system. And now, that's why we did the study, try to get the data back and see what, what the results are. It's not that simple to do, though. It's, you can imagine identifying a thousand different strains of bacteria. And it's not just the bacteria, but it's what they poo in you. You have two to five pounds of bacteria living in your colon at any given time. That's a trillion creatures eating, drinking, and pooing inside you. They're defecating in you constantly. And what they poo in you depends on what you feed them. If you feed your bacteria meat, you get things like trimethylamine oxidase forming, which irritates the blood vessels, causes cancer and heart disease, and it's a mess. If you feed your bacteria soluble fiber, which is their normal food, they form vitamin K and nutrients and things that you need. So you want your bacteria pooing fertilizer in you, not toxic waste. That's why you need to feed your bacteria the foods that the healthy human gut flora are designed to eat, which are soluble fibers. You don't want the bacteria having to break down the mucosal membrane of your intestinal tract for food. You want to make sure there's a plentiful, rich, uh, positive nutrient environment. Number nine, fast when appropriate. Did our ancient ancestors like to fast? Yeah. Oh yeah, they just, did they ever do it voluntarily? No. no. They did it by force when spring came late. You know, natural setting, sometimes spring just comes late. There's nothing to eat, you're in a situation. Now what's interesting is human beings can fast. Essentially what that means is they can change their brain fuel from burning the normal fuel, which is glucose, to bring beta hydroxybutyric acid, which is ketones, for fat breakdown. That's really unusual. Like even chimpanzees, we're pretty close to chimpanzees, we share a lot of traits, they can't fast. The chimp brain never converts over to burning fat, it always burns glucose, which is why it can only go about a week before it dies without food. Which is why, how many chimps have you ever seen wandering away from the tropics? You never find chimps wandering out where there's, you know, because spring comes late, they, they wouldn't make it. And all the humans that couldn't fast died, every one of them. Because when they wander away from the tropics, sometimes there's nothing to eat. And, if you can, and the human brain is so ridiculously large, 30% of our energy, it's our major burden of glucose, it's just a ridiculous behemoth, incredibly energy inefficient system. But it gives us some skills that we, you know, a lot of stuff to survive. But in order for humans to survive, they had to be able to change their fuel of this ridiculously large machine from burning sugar to burning something else, in this case, fat stores. And as a consequence, humans can go, skinny male can go 70 days without eating, which allowed us to survive these periods of deprivation. And that's why humans were able to wander all over the planet. 
because of our ability to fast. Fasting was such a critically necessary biological adaptation. Which is what we've done is we've taken this ancient practice and applied it in a modern, very unusual situation of dietary excess. Most of the conditions that everybody you know is going to die from are conditions of dietary excess. Heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, lymphoma, these are all dietary excess related conditions. Dietary excess <clears throat> is reversed with fasting. Metabolic syndrome, which is what everybody's dying from, is more aggressively, more effectively treated with fasting than anything else we know of. That's essentially what our research is, is investigating and demonstrating. And it's not like shocking if eating too much causes problems. You get fat, you get heart disease. And it's not surprising that not eating would allow your body to not do it. It just does it dis disproportionately. We're trying to raise money right now to get a DEXA scanner. That with a new software, DEXA scanners tells not only bone density is used traditionally to read for osteoporosis, but it can tell you not only how much fat's on your body, but specifically how much visceral fat. And the visceral fat is the thought that's the fat that's associated with disease. The fat inside your blood vessels, the fat inside your organs. With this scanner, what we've done so far, we've used a scanner in San Francisco, because we don't have one yet. But the scanner in San Francisco, we've done it on three subjects already, before, during, and after fasting. And basically what you see is like they'll lose 4% of their body fat in say a 10 day fat, or body weight in a 10 day fast, 10% of their body fat and 20% of their visceral fat. Another subject lost 4% of their body total weight, 12% of their fat, but 40% of their visceral fat. So visceral fat was being disproportionately mobilized, which is kind of exciting if you're trying to get rid of visceral fat because there's nothing else that I know of that's been shown to do that. So, you know, if it turns, we're gonna do a study. Um, we've got this company uh, is gets, is, going to get us one of these scanners. We're raising money to purchase it right now. We'll be able to do this um, on, you know, uh, a couple hundred uh, fasting patients, and we'll be able to definitively show uh, what we think is that visceral fat is selectively mobilized, which makes sense that the body would go in and get rid of the fat that's most dangerous and least valuable to its survival, and it does it in fasting because the body has some apparently inherent wisdom that's pretty cool. Would you give um, yeah, I think I've got a slide that's coming up here. So, but basically, it was four, in this one case, it was 4% of total body weight, but 10% of total body fat, 20% of total visceral fat, and only 1% of lean tissue. And then what was even more important, after the fast, people gain weight back, right? Because they rehydrate, they, they put glycogen back in their and they build their muscles. They gain no fat. All the weight gain after fasting, all that realimentation was, was, is lean tissue, and that's been in all of them. If you feed them properly, they do gain weight back right away because two pounds of glycogen, two pounds of fiber in the gut, several pounds sometimes of fluid because of dehydration, but it's not fat and no visceral fat. So now they're building back up lean tissue. This is going to be a really compelling study. It may not even be that important clinically in the sense that there's so many other things we're doing that are probably more important, but people are gonna go nuts over this. If you can show that the fat lost is the important fat and that what's gained is muscle, and I mean, you can imagine that's gonna be like. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to say, I'm um, getting. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take to regulate it completely after water fasting? Um, by the length of the fast feeding, most people are, are, are you know, after refeeding. Yeah, it takes about the length of the fast refeeding to get a person stabilized. What, what, what exactly are you, when you say re um, I, I Tomorrow I start uh, water fasting for, yes. uh, to plan for two weeks. So if you have a two week fast, you're going to lose about 14 pounds during that two week fast. Of that, some of it's fat, some of it's uh, uh, water, some of it's glycogen, some of it's fiber in your gut. So what, you're going to lose all that weight, 14 pounds. You're going to regain five of it within a few days. But none of that's going to be fat. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the glycogen will come back in after a couple of days, a couple of pounds there. You're going to put some fiber back into the gut, which will have been empty. And you're going to rehydrate. And you're going to build your muscle tissue. But you're not going to be gaining fat because you're going to be eating like we feed you, which is enough to retain optimal mm -hmm. weight, but not the fat weight. And that's what's really cool is you're going to take the fat off, you're going to put the lean tissue on, and then you're going to stick strictly to a whole plant food SOS free diet for 50 years, and after which time you can do whatever you want. That's it. That's the model. The only thing with you is it would be nice if we could figure out how to reduce stress or increase stress management because you live in the twilight zone. So. I come in. Uh, I'm sure someone's age was my son. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Actually, we can schedule that now. That's, <laughs> you know, we'll set that 2080. I like that. Thank you. I'm getting a DEXA scan on Saturday. Yes. Um, and I was curious because I'm visceral fat, which is so hard to lose, and I don't have any previous scan. Yeah. Whatever we thought I was doing, it would never change the visceral fat. So yeah. I'm really curious to see how it goes. Where are you doing it? Um, so there's actually a truck that drives around the Bay Area. Okay, and they have the software, the new software? Uh, I, I don't know. The company's called BodySpec. Um, but okay. they have the DEXA scan on okay. the trucks. So yeah, that's that's good. I hope they have the new software. The, the, yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah, that that'll be good. What so are you guys talking about? This is a DEXA scan. scanner. We're, we actually have a unit that we've identified. We're working with the company. We're going to be uh, hopefully getting it here in the next few weeks. And um, the uh, bad thing about DEXA scanners, there's several bad things. One, they take quite a bit of space, so we have to allocate quite a bit of room. Um, the, uh, they're very expensive, you know, expensive piece of equipment. And they use very low dose uh, radiation. So you're, it's very much like walking through the scanner at the airport. You know, you have a very low dose, but there is some exposure. So uh, I think they said one, uh, pass, one, one pass through the DEXA scanner is equivalent to a you know, pass at the airport, if you do, which we tell you not to do. You gotta have them patch it down. Yes. Um, if you were to look at the fat, can you tell the visceral fat? It, it requires a different software okay. than what they're using for it. We'll be able to do actually both with this machine, mm -hmm. but it's it's really pretty new, and it's it's whole, 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 Holistics is the company that makes this. It's the so, the machine is the, is not the issue. It's the software that does the interpretation. That's so really it's, special. It's not like an X-ray that you can look at and see. It is. You get a scan. But without the software, you can't get the you can't get the body fat. You know, it's a it's a little different kind of a tell you deal. Where the pounds of fat are in your body. Yeah, they can give get a nice picture. Everybody's gonna like it. You get a little report. It's gonna be you know. It, what the thing is, I'm really reluctant because it's a from a practice. People that are like building practices and whatever. Oh, people love this kind of stuff. And I've always carefully avoided getting involved with any of that stuff because it's all marketing hoo ha. In this particular case, though. The ability to identify visceral fat load and changes relatively non-invasively is, is particularly exciting. And so I'm particularly interested because I broke my clavicle and in the testing of you know the bone, they um, he's obviously a good radiologist, he also mentioned um, that I have uh, atherosclerosis or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the calcification in the aorta. Yeah, absolutely. So on any x-ray you, you take, it's, you can see that. And there is a, what's interesting though is the calcification of the arteries isn't actually what kills people. It's a, it's, it's a sign of inflammation and aging. We don't like it. But it's the small fatty plaques that break loose and cause the clots and strokes. And that isn't detected with the calcium thing. So, you know, again, it's a marker. It's a marker of inflammation. And that's what this diet and lifestyle approach does is it, it no question, reduce inflammation. We can measure that with acute phase reactor proteins. There's all kinds of testing. We know that inflammation goes down in fasting. You, many of you can experience because you come in with inflamed joints and swollen, and, and you feel the changes. It doesn't even take that long sometimes. So, uh, fasting was only done by. Oh. I had a quick question. So, during the fast, you lose that visceral fat. And subcutaneous fat. Right. So once you start refeeding and if you continue to eat this way, will you still lose that visceral fat as you go? Yes, you will still lose fat, including visceral fat. Um, it's it's a little bit slower. Okay. And there's things you can do to speed it up. You can do intermittent fasting where you narrow your feeding window to eight hours a day, and that selectively allows you to mobilize fat more, particularly in, during that morning exercise and stuff. So there are things you can do to augment. Fat loss, or you can just eat really good all the time, and eventually your fat goes away, and you end up, you know, getting where you need to go. And we don't know yet whether, like, if you just lose ten pounds with healthy eating, do you lose as much visceral fat as yes, if you lose yeah. it? It looks like the visceral fat is being selectively mobilized oh. during fasting, which is like if that turns out to be true, that's kind of a big deal. So we'll be all excited about that. But whether it is or it isn't true, the fact is, at the very least, fasting is a helpful tool to help people get fat off, clear the palate. Obviously, if you don't make diet and lifestyle changes, it's, right, it's, it's all good. stupid, you know, we gotta get the lifestyle changes. Just quickly, did you say morning exercise? Is that what you recommend Well, exercise? if you don't eat, 
breakfast till say eight or nine or 10 and you're exercising in the morning, you're gonna selectively mobilize fat during that early morning exercise. Okay, that's one of the things with intermittent fasting is that <clears throat> if you eat X number of calories <clears throat> during eight hours versus if you ate X number, the same number of calories over 12 hours, you will gain more weight spreading it out over 12 hours than you will eating in a more limited window. I think Dr. Morano, for those of you who were here on Wednesday, talked about some of this, didn't she? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, all of this is academic. If you just eat a whole plant food SOS-free diet, you're gonna get your optimum weight, or very close to it. You know, if you're a female, those last couple pounds can be really tough, because your brain is not, if you're a woman, your brain isn't like all happy about you losing fat, no matter how fat you are. You can be 100 pounds overweight, and you're losing weight, your brain goes, what are you doing? You stupid fool, we worked hard to store those fat reserves. When spring comes late, we want you to survive and all them skinny ones won't make it. Your brain will warn you when you're losing fat and signal you with neurochemistry saying, hey, hey, stupid, you're hemorrhaging strategic fat reserves. Stop it. No more salad. Go get some ice cream or something that's <laughs> gonna stop the hemorrhaging. Your brain, it doesn't matter where you are. Notice how much easier it is to, to stabilize weight than to lose weight? When you're stable, your brain doesn't complain too much, whatever you are. But if you're actively losing weight, your brain does the calculation and says, wait a second, you're losing a pound a day. It, you know, in a month or two, we're dead. And it's gonna try to stop that. It's not happy about you losing fat. Because in a natural setting, first of all, you never would be fat. And if you were fat, that was a huge benefit because you could live a little bit longer than the skinny ones when spring came late. So the ability to store fat was like a really valuable thing. And as a consequence, today, you live in this world where now it seems like a disadvantage. Like when people come to me and say, well, I don't even, if I walk by the buffet table, I gain a pound. A bad dream, I go up a pound. That's a good sign. If you get fat easily, that's a good thing biologically. That means you've got good plumbing. You absorb what you eat. You store it for reserves. That's great. It's just that in this environment, this very recent abnormal environment where there's this dietary excess available, you're screwed. Because you can't eat any of that processed crap without storing too much fat and then getting sick and dying a premature death. You know, these people that can eat whatever they want and they never gain any weight, that's not a good thing. And also, we set this model, we're supposed to have the bones sticking out in our face and look like those heroin addicts on the fashion magazines. <laughs> and believe me, when you meet those heroin addicts, they don't look like that. That's called Photoshop. My wife is a photographer, and she can make, oh my gosh, you take a picture, it look completely different. That's what they're doing. And so you start getting in your head, you're supposed to have the bones thing and the thing. Not necessarily what your body wants, so it's actually healthy. Now, on the other hand, if you're overweight, you pay a price for it. But that price goes away as soon as you change your diet. Because the weight just starts going. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating this diet, does your body know when you're at your optimal weight? Yeah, that's the cool thing. Is that you get, as you get closer to your optimum weight, I say that last two pounds, your body's going to fight. It's not going to get rid of that last little bit. And if you want that last two pounds, you might have to tighten the screws even further. Like even limiting how much of these whole foods that you eat, or you know, the feeding window, or a little exercise, or you know to get that last little spell thing. But as far as obesity, there is no obesity on this diet. It's sustainable, you can't, because the fiber's too much, the feed, you just, it's, you don't find people adopting a whole plant food SOS free diet that don't get, you know, relatively close to their weight. Not necessarily, though, that heroin addicted fashion model without actually tightening the screws further. Yeah. Like, for example, AJ, um, will tell her story publicly, so I can use her as an example. She talks about how she got to a certain weight but it wasn't quite, what did she have to do? She had to get rid of some of the more concentrated foods like the nuts and seeds. It wasn't fasting. We never fasted AJ. So it's all just, she continued to tighten the dietary screws up and then she's figured out how to avoid whatever food triggers and whatever issues and that, that she has. That's caloric density. She talks about the red line and all that. Yeah. You know, that's great. But the point is, if you just, especially if you're a male and have testosterone, see if you're a woman, you have estrogen. And estrogen is a fat storage hormone. So you're designed to store fat. You think about it, women essentially are energy conserving biological fat storage devices. That's essentially what a female in any species is. Males have testosterone, fat burning hormone. So if you inject women with testosterone, they lose all their fat. 
and then they get hairy and get cancer and die. It's not a good strategy. If you take men and inject them with estrogen, what happens? They get fat. They grow breasts and get hips and they store fat. So these are biological differences. So if you're a woman, what does it mean? It means you have to work twice as hard to get half the results. As hey. normal. Yeah, well, it's not just here, it's everywhere, so get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, keto diets, what's good for short term weight loss isn't necessarily a sustainable or healthy long term plan. Like, if you just want to lose 40 pounds overnight, just cut your leg off at the hip. <laughs> okay, you want to lose 80 pounds? Take them both off. It's still. Right. So, you can go on a high protein, high fat diet without eating animal food. So it'd be somewhat less toxic than the dead Dr. Atkins diet made us full of soul rest in peace. But it's still not healthy or sustainable. The reason why keto works is it's a fasting mimicking diet. By putting you into ketosis, there's a hunger blunting effect that has nothing to do with being sustainable or healthy long term. So this is a much more difficult to do because you can't eat the meat, you can't go to the fast food and throw out the bun and whatever. It's much more difficult to do. You're not using salt, oil, and sugar, so it's, it's you know, very frustrating. You're going to be a social outcast. It's going to create a lot of trouble, but it's a sustainable diet. These people can stay a whole plant food diet until they die of natural causes going to sleep at 108. You don't have to die like the dead Dr. Atkins at, you know, in his 70s from cardiomyopathy. But at least he wasn't a hypocrite. I bet he did stick to his program until he died, so that's good. So. All right, would you speak to, to, to paleo diet? Because yeah. so, you know, first, and you could find a number of books, very credentialed people, and as many people on YouTube that speak about vegan, that speak about you know the paleo. Oh, way more speaking about paleo. Way, way more, more And that's what I, over the last oh, yeah. five years. And they're quite, they're very well, um, uh, have research credentials, very well credentialed, and, um, and speak very, you know, and and give a lot of epidemiological as well as lab results to the point where Mark Hyman has, it has interviewed some of these people and he says, well, I'm, I'm staying vegan, but I absolutely agree that this is this is just as helpful of a diet. So okay, why so based on, it's not? first of all, there's very little <clears throat> research on what I'm talking about here in terms of whole plant food SMS free diets. Most vegan diets are terrible. And most of the literature, I mean, like I said, I speak at national vegan conferences and tell them that a lot of these vegans would be better off eating meat because of all that processed vegan stuff. So let's be clear, the literature they're citing is they're comparing vegan diets, which Coca-Cola is vegan, French fries are vegan, you know, Oreos. there's Oreos are vegan. I mean, yeah, so let's not be okay. comparing what we're advocating to a vegan diet. Okay. So if you're gonna compare vegan to paleo or whatever, yeah, they're all, you know, you, you may be able to make a good case for whatever it is you wanna do. But if you're talking about a whole plant food diet that's SOS free, and you compare that to any of these, you're going to find from a health, long term health sustaining And you have a clean paleo, which, you know, sort well, of just clean, something being organic, being less bad, and doesn't make Vegetables it, and root vegetables yeah. and just and, and fruit if you want it. If you just compare that to a standard American diet, you may get tremendous benefit okay. because everybody's eating as much meat as they can anyway. It's just, of course, they're eating all this processed, refined carbohydrates. And grain. We all agree on that. Get rid of the oils, the sugars, but everybody can agree with that. Now, the question is is there any advantage? to including animal or higher protein vegetable, vegetarian foods or animal foods. And there is, and the, and the reason is because the keto diet has a hunger blunting effect because you're in ketosis, anything that allows people to lose excess weight is gonna have some net clinical benefit. When I'm not talking about that though, even Mercola and others that are advocating this will admit that you gotta cycle in and cycle out, you don't wanna necessarily sustain it longer because you get all the problems that come from being, you don't go on a water fast forever either, do you? You know, that doesn't work out so well either. So I'm not arguing that they can't get better clinical results, say, doing a, a paleo diet than whatever else it is people are doing, and that the, there may be some net benefit to those people. What I'm talking about is what's the long-term sustainable diet most associated with long-term optimal health? That's a whole plant food SOS-free diet. And so is that practical? No, people want to be able to eat out. And, do, and so they're going to argue, well, this is more practical. What good does your extreme diet do if people won't follow it? That's a legitimate argument. You can make that argument. Okay, if you can't follow this, then it, but you can follow that, that might be better than something else. But let's not pretend that you can put a person on a high fat, high protein diet and not pay the cost. Price. Well, again, I'm saying, you know, a payload where the idea is it's a substantial amount of vegetables and sub meat and some fruit if you want it, but basically that idea and the blood markers 
are fantastic. Over well, compared to yeah, period. Let's be clear though. Let's take a look at high blood pressure, for example, the leading contributing cause of death in the spleen. Right. There is a study that is the largest effect size ever shown in treating high blood pressure mm -hmm. ever. Okay, average effect size 60 points in stage three hypertension. 174 out of 174 patients with hypertension normalized blood pressure without medication. That's the study we did with T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University using fasting and a whole plant food diet. Mm -hmm. So. There's nothing even close to that. Now, are you going to argue, well, we could do a paleo diet, we could lower some pressure more so that, yeah, absolutely. And I got no problem. For people that aren't interested in doing this, there's all kinds of stepping stone things that you can do. When What we see, obviously, are the, if, the, if the paleo diets worked for them, we wouldn't be seeing it. We see them come here, we clean them up, and they do even better. Uh, it's the same thing you could argue with John McDougall. He will argue that, look, you can't take away salt and sugar for everybody. If you give them more flexible, people can stick to it better, they're happier, they're, and that's fine. But when their blood pressure doesn't come down, he punishes them and sends them to True North Health Center, the last resort. So I'm not arguing that what we're advocating is good for everybody or practical, or it's just for the highly motivated people. Either they're doing it intellectually or they're doing it because they have no choice, or they're doing it because they particularly want to do a long-term survival. Okay, this is a, I think, a better approach. If it wasn't, I would be to advocate pedal. Can you imagine how much easier it would be to, if we could advocate, give them some salmon and give them what they want and stop having it? You know, we don't have like a, a vested interest in denying people everything they want. It's just that our experience has been, our observation, and now our research is suggesting that the best way to reach out and help that is to reduce the likelihood of debility so that you live until you die is this kind of approach. It's the most difficult, it's not practical. If, if you want to sell books, I remember when we had the Pleasure Trek come out, and one of the, uh, it was actually one of the big publishing houses re reviewed it, and the guy that, that actually makes the decision are not the editors, it's the marketing people. And this guy was like 400 pounds, when he was huge. And he said, well, you've got to make some changes. I said, well, what changes? He said, you've got to stop with this, pleasure's bad, and start telling people to drink red wine and eat dark chocolate and, you know, and he was pointing to the Atkins diet, 10 million copies sold. And we said, well, we can't do that. That's not true. He goes, well, you want to tell the truth or you want to sell books? Yeah. <laughs> we said, well, we want to sell books. He said, well, get them out of here and quit wasting our time. You're not going to sell any books telling people that they can't have anything. And so, you know, it was an interesting, it was she, the editor that actually brought it to them. So they said they threw food at her at the, at the oh. lunch thing because they thought it was just so ridiculous. That, and they were right. Athens sold 10 million books before he died, and the pleasure trap has sold 100,000 copies. So, uh, so far. Yeah. So it's you know, if you want to make money, you sell the pleasure trap. Who are the most lucrative companies in the in the in the country? Um, alcohol, drugs, you know, pharmaceutical, recreational drugs, highly processed foods. I mean, that's where the money is. Give people what they want, not what they need. So you know, that's not our particular thing. So. Is the paleo and the keto diets better than, yeah, they, they, they can, especially ones which isn't actually applied, by the way, but if they do a bunch of vegetables with a little bit of meat. Let's be clear, there's no evidence that a 100% vegan diet works better than a mostly vegan diet with a little bit of meat. Right. Words, if you look at the literature, the epidemiological literature, people that eat very small amounts of meat, think Asian, whatever, they don't have heart disease. So, you know, now, it's also a little bit exciting. I can see why people might want to include a little bit of animal food in their diet, even though I don't. It's like jumping out of a plane with a parachute. Because, you know, when you first jump out, you don't know, is the chute going to open or are you going to crash and kill yourself? And then you pull the cord and the chute opens and then you think, oh my God, I could break my legs when I land. And then finally you land and if you're not dead, you feel so alive. <laughs> and so eating meat can also be exciting. You know, am I gonna get explosive diarrhea? Is this gonna be the food poisoning? Am I gonna get exposed to uh, prions that are gonna melt down and cause me to have Alzheimer's disease and fast forward? Am I gonna get like, and if you don't, that's why you must feel so alive, right? So, I mean, I understand, I wouldn't wanna do it, but I can understand why people do it. So, and also, again, a high vegetable diet with small amounts of meat, far superior than some vegan, highly processed diet that's full of... Now, the problem is most vegans are not health conscious. They're mostly animal rights, environmental, social justice. You know, they're, they're driven by moral, ethical, and spiritual reasons. Health is, you know, kind of a side effect. And so when I get up at a national vegan conference and say that you'd be better off eating meat, oh my God, that is like the ultimate sin. Because... 
regardless of the health consequences, they're more, you know, as long as they're not eating meat, they're, at least the planet's going to survive and the animals aren't going to die, and how can I possibly compare, you know, the righteousness? So here's what I say, is that being a vegan may get you into heaven because of the moral, ethical, and spiritual benefits, but it won't delay how quickly you go to heaven unless you go vegan SOS free. So, you know, that's what our, we're trying to pitch. We're coming from a health viewpoint. We don't deny the moral, ethical, and spiritual benefits of going on a planet. So honestly, if you think about the environmental impact, there's probably nothing you could do that would be more powerful for the environment than going on a plant-based diet. They say that if people went vegan, it would have a bigger effect than if we eliminated all internal combustion engines. I mean, it's a big consequence in terms of global warming and all the rest of it. So now I know that I read that tweet that said there is no climate change, so we don't have to worry about it. But I don't know if I can believe that, even though it was on the internet. Okay, number 10 on our list of 10 most important things is education inspiration, another Dr. Lyle insistence. So I said, no, once you teach people to get healthy, that's it, they'll just do it forever. And he said, oh, that's not true. They'll do it for a while, but when the motivation is gone, pain, debility, and fear of death, then they'll go back to some of their old bad habits. And plus, they won't want to be social outcasts, so they'll want to go along and get along. And it's going to be this big, ongoing, lifelong battle that you're going to continue to have to fight. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous, you psychologists. But it turns out he's right. It's this big ongoing battle. So you have to continue to educate and inspire yourself. That's why you read books, you do video things. We're actually doing research to find out what channels of support will work the best, depending on your personality, at sustaining long-term success. That's one of the areas of research in our adherence study that we're going in. And so that's where web things and books and videos and programs like AJs and all these kinds of different support groups we're investigating to figure what it's going to take to get people in line. I know from experience the best motivating factors are pain, debility, and fear of death. So if you're not fortunate enough to be driven by pain, debility, and fear of death, you have to work harder <laughs> at sustaining yourself because it's hard, you know, if, if you're not in. That's why I love patients with autoimmune disease because even a single meal can put them into agony and that tends to motivate them to stay on track. Um, and now also that's why channel factors and tension systems are important. So, sometimes the problems with people is it's, you know, this is a lot more work. You can't just drive into McDonald's and get your 2,000 calories. You have to like shop or chop or do stuff. So we've worked with two companies now, so far, that have agreed to offer vegan SOS free foods in their national distribution chain. Leafside has freeze dried food. The reason why freeze dried food can be useful is that you're traveling, you can carry this and all it needs is hot water. Okay, so, and, and they offer everything as an SOS free option. Now, if you go onto the site through the, our landing page at True North, that'll do two things. You get all the SOS free options, and also they donate a percentage to the True North Health Foundation, which is really good. And then Mama says it's ready to heat and eat. So this comes ready to either eat, heat it up and eat it, or you can freeze it. Okay, but you can't travel with it because it's, you know, it's got moisture in it. So freeze dried, fresh. Both something, this has like a four month shelf life, so you can order some stuff and then you can use it occasionally when you want to augment your thing or you got came home late from work and you just need to get some bean dish or something quick and easy to go over. And this you can use, you know, they actually have, you can get all your food if you don't want to cook at all. So, or, or any portion thereof. So both of these though, here's the cards that tells you how to go on there. SOS free. Now they also offer stuff that has some salt and is more flexible. It's all vegan, but offer more flexible for the 90% of people that don't want to eat healthy. But now we have hundreds of people that have actually joined up and now they're offering more and more. They've gotten the chef, the Ramses books. They're offering bigger varieties. As more and more people opt for that, there'll be other companies that'll come along, plus they'll be able to offer more stuff. So we really happy with these guys. And then the other thing I wanted to mention while we're doing advertisements is the um, Mama's, is, uh, uh, Amazon. If you buy, you've heard of Amazon? Yeah? So if you buy anything from Amazon, they allow you to pick a charity. You can pick one 501c3 nonprofit charity. We are one of their oh lists. True North is one word, True North. If you pick us up, there's other True Space North, but we're True North Health. If you select us once, they'll remember that, and then forever, whenever you buy stuff by entering Amazon through smile.amazon.com, explains it here. They will make a donation, and we have 780 people that have selected us as their, their donors. And it also reminds you, every time you order from Amazon, they say, oh, you're supporting True North Health Foundation. 
which will remind you when it comes time to do your bequests and whatever, <laughs> to list True North Health Foundation as your 501c3 charity. You get all your deductions, charitable trust donation, we do all that stuff, and we've had some very generous uh, patients. In fact, we just got a $10,000 donation towards the scanner uh, that we put out an email. Uh, anyway, so uh, Amazon costs you nothing. It doesn't cost any more to buy the stuff. They just, they, they're a company that makes a donation. We want you to do that. And, uh, I have two questions. First of all, how much more do you need for your machine? Forty thousand dollars, but we're we've got some money coming in, so mm -hmm. we're going to raise it before next month. Hopefully. And do you have a club for people who have left you a bequest in their estate plan? We do. We have um, a number of people that have. Um, uh, we've we've actually had one patient that passed that we we've actually received the bequest, which was helpful when we set up the lab upstairs. We just so you know, when you come here. The proceeds from your estate here go to True North Health Foundation, and all of the proceeds from anything you buy, if you buy a supplement or whatever, the doctors get nothing. So they have no motivation to recommend anything to you. 100% of any net from anything goes to the True North Health Foundation, not to the doctors. So that's number one. Number two, so just staying here, you're participating in the foundation. The main source of revenue for the True North Health Foundation is the yearly uh, transfer that occurs from the True North Health Center. Our net operating revenues go to foundation and we have our own lab now we have a BSL2 lab we have an extraction hood we can freeze it 86 below we've got refrigerated centrifuge we've got all the little toys necessary to take the samples extract them freeze them send them off to the various research labs for processing eventually we'll raise enough money to do a, um, our own processing upstairs we'll get a plate reader and we'll be able to actually do like all the lab that we routinely do we'll be doing upstairs that'll cut the cost dramatically and allow us to do a broader range of testing, both for our fast patients and also for our research subjects. Do you have any, any plans for the growth of the health center? Yeah, we have um, other places, doctors that we train. We train about 30 doctors a year. And Dr. Gershfeld in Southern California, Dr. Ewan in Ohio, Dr. Sabatino in Florida, Dr. Sinke in Texas are now operating small facilities. We don't have an ownership interest in them. We just provide them patients. We just refer patients to them. Um, we, we will continue to train doctors. That's part of the mission of the Trinity Health Foundation. So the way it works is the foundation has two branches, research and education. We're doing primary research on water-only fasting. We've completed a few studies. One of the studies was this taste and eradication study. It hasn't been published yet, but we're, we're in the process of doing, completing that now, where we show changes in taste perception as a consequence of fasting. We did this gut microbiome study with Luigi Fontana, looking at the changes in the microbiome in the gut and after long-term fasting. We currently, we're down, we have two more subjects we have to process for a study we're doing with the Mayo Clinic. And, the, and it's a study on primary prevention of stroke. A researcher from the Mayo Clinic came here as a patient, did well, decided he thought it would be good to prevent strokes rather than treat them after they happen. So we're looking at biomarker changes before and after fasting associated with stroke, showing what, what, those, what happens to those. We have a study, we're going to do this. Uh, um, a uh, phase one clinical trial in the treatment of hypertension using water instead of a drug as the clinical trial. That's going to be starting in, in a couple months. We're going to do this DEXA scanner study looking at uh, the mobilization of visceral fat. It'll happen as soon as we can get this, this, the uh, scanner here. Uh, and we're going to be doing what's called an adherence study. We've got a validated vegan or a whole plant food questionnaire, and we're going to be studying what it takes to get compliance in people and what channels of support will help improve compliance. And so those are all going to happen next year. We've actually hired some additional staff. We have uh, Eve, whose picture isn't up yet, but she's got a PhD in biochemistry who's joined us. Uh, we have a medical doctor named Sam who's coming back, who's a resident now coming back to work for us on the research side. And then director of research is Tasha Myers, the PhD postdoc at Columbia University. Brilliant woman. The very first thing she did with us is she got our first paper published in the British Medical Journal, which was a treat, effective treatment of lymphoma with fasting and follow-up diet. We have a three-year follow-up published and a four-year follow-up on record now of that uh, case. So we're looking at more lymphoma patients so we can do eventually do a clinical trial. We've got a lot of stuff going on the research side that's really exciting because it's all virgin data. Nobody's ever really done anything with us. And now we're getting players like Mayo Clinic, Washington University, the Buck Institute. We did a study with them that are coming to us wanting to use our physical plant and laboratory site, because to do this kind of work in a medical thing is impossible. It's $2,500 a night per person just to have somebody in a metabolic ward. 
and then they cheat and go out, it's, you know, it's a big problem. So for them, it means they can get human subject studies done dramatically less expensively. And, and we have our own IRD with federal-wide assurance so we can uh, submit and get our own studies approved with people that are sympathetic to FAST and know something about it, rather than trying to go to a, a user-based university system where they think everybody's gonna die if you don't eat for a few days. And we have published a safety set that shows that FAST can be done safely and that led Walter Longo in his book that warns people don't do any actual fasting because it's too dangerous, with one exception, if you do it at the True North Health Center. So Walter still gets to go to heaven. Because I evaluate other researchers' intelligence based on how much they agree with me. So that makes him a damn genius. <laughs> but he's been brilliant. And he's, what, he's the guy that's really published a lot of the stuff that's gotten it out there with the intermittent fasting and all that stuff. So anyway, that's basically what we're trying to do. So we're, we've been fortunate because we haven't been dependent on fundraising in order to be able to move forward because we had the center revenue stream in order to, to fund it. And now we're getting to the point where we're adding all these researchers. So we have a big nut now. Now we have to start raising funding. So we're able to apply for grants from the NIH. We're able to get funding from our patients. And we've, and we've been getting some of this affiliate funding, um, which has been really good. The problem we've run into is we can we have to raise at least 25% of our research funding from not from the center. The way that 501c3 is, you can't, when, when the center donates, it's really just me donating the money to the foundation. Well, that's fine, except that it can only represent 75% of the foundation's operating budget, or you lose your nonprofit status. And so we have to raise some money outside, even if we had enough money to get through the project, we still have to raise money outside in order to meet the requirements. So when people are donating, there's really like a three to one benefit to us because for every dollar that we raise from donations, we can put three dollars in from the, from the operational thing. And so now we're doing that. We're raising enough money to offset the money that we're able to generate clinically. And so, um, it's, it's actually working out really well. Plus, we have a couple patients now that have um, foundations. And so there were certain uh, milestones we had to meet for them, for their foundations to fund us. And we're, we're just about there. We're publishing enough stuff. So now we're going to hopefully be able to get a stream of funding. The other thing we want to do is public education. And so public education mostly is about training doctors on fasting supervision. We have a program here that's funded by the foundation. In other words, we provide doctors a small stipend to cover their student loans, they, and we provide them housing and room and board and training. And it doesn't cost the doctors anything. But we're an ND residency training site. We have four ND residents here training right now. We're a, a chiropractor's training setting. They come for three months. The last three months of their education can be done here. We're um, the medical doctors at some schools, like Texas A&M. They have a functional medicine training program. Those doctors come for one month as part of their medical training now. And so we're getting about 30 doctors a year are trained in doing this kind of work. We're encouraging them to go open up their own facilities and then providing them access both to our software as well as the um, patients, you know, because we'll, we get a lot of more patient traffic than we can really handle. And so it's a benefit to them and us because we, the requirement is that they must collaborate with our research. We'll literally give them the software if they agree to work with us on the research because then we can extract the data efficiently. We spent $100,000 doing custom software the final version of that program launches next week. Wow. So we're using it now, but there's a, a much more sophisticated version of it that we've had developed that will launch as soon as Justin comes back from Canada. Dr. Wise has our, been our tester. Okay, so what was the point of this? Uh, research, planning. Oh, so public education. So do you remember that video clip I showed? Yeah. Making Health Lessons showed the same actor, different paths, choices, what happens. So we want to develop a series of those viral videos. We have a guy coming in tomorrow who actually was the marketing director from State Farm Insurance or something. So he's got a lot of background. He's going to help us. We're going to produce a, a, a series of viral videos that show kids, like the choice, what happens if the kid does one way versus the other, uh, young adults, older adults, kind of through the whole life path of what your decision, what the consequences of your decision making is. We think those can go viral. They'll be, they'll be branded standalone little video clips that can go out there and really piss a lot of people off. <laughs> you know, people can send it to people, it's all easy and free in 30 seconds, and you know, 
So that's one strategy we have. We're also in the process of writing a book called Can Fasting Save Your Life? And Can Fasting Save Your Life will review the work that we've done, the research that we've done, the philosophy and principles that we believe. And we have a publisher for it already. We know that there's a market out there for it. And um, there'll be a section in the back that's really geared more towards researchers and clinicians, and the, but the main book will be written to the public. It'll basically summarize all the stuff we're doing. We're working on that right now. That'll also be completed next year. So we're gonna do those three clinical trials. We're gonna publish five more case reports. We're gonna, we're gonna do Confessing Save Your Life, and we're gonna finish the, our lab component by getting the DEXA scanner uh, in place. So we've got a fairly ambitious uh, in agenda for next year, but at least we have all the employees. We have 72 employees here now, and uh, five of them which are, are just research-based um, people. And we've got a number of contractors as well. So we're, we're, we're getting to the point now where they're coming to us. There are people that actually want to do something worthwhile with their life instead of go to hell. And so we're getting doctors and researchers that are disgusted with the conventional stuff and they see that we're trying to do something a little differently. So it's making us, and we're getting affiliations with these really major places like Mayo Clinic and Washington University. I mean, it doesn't really get any better than those places as far as being able to actually get stuff published and whatnot. So that's a really good sign because fasting has gone from being criminal quackery to cutting edge research. Twelve years ago, the California Board of Medical Quality Assurance said recommending fasting to a patient was such a gross violation of the standard of medical practice that it rose to the level of criminal negligence. I actually had a criminal defense attorney represent me. I was the first person that ever needed a criminal defense attorney in my family. My father was so proud. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. But anyway, they, we won that, so we're still here. So. Well, I think, you know, Ramses has some ideas about how, and that would be his domain, it's about, you know, communicating to, here's the thing, once we create enough demand, then they'll, people will be interested in doing it. It's just like happened, once we created enough demand, these two national companies were willing to offer vegan SOS free food. We couldn't use them until it was too salty and it was just too crappy. Now we can do it, we can do it. Okay, and the same thing is going to happen as soon as people start going into restaurants saying, oh, you don't have a whole plant food SOS free? Oh, that's too bad. I guess I'll have to take my business elsewhere. You bet they'll start training chefs in, on how to do this. And it's tricky. You know, Ramses was really the first chef in the country that did SOS free cooking. There was no other. I mean, ours were the first cookbooks. And even right now, there's Bravo, Bravo Express. AJ's new book is SOS free. Kathy's book is SOS free. That, that's about it. And your book. Oh, and the Health Point Cookbook was the original. Yeah, Health Point Cookbook. <laughs> Forgot about that. Do you have a dialogue with Dr. Bland by any chance? Since Jeffrey Bland, since yes. He's got yeah. two generations now of functional medicine. Doctors Jeffrey Bland is interesting because he'll say, know, like, of thousands of you people. don't want to do fasting because it's too dangerous unless you use his proprietary products. Oh, then yes, it's perfectly right. fine. As long as you take all your clear, yeah. The metagenics that he created. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. the legitimate criticism of fasting, and the, even the criticism that Walter Longa says, is look, no question, long-term water fasting, that's the gold standard, all that. But it's not practical, because people have to go to an inpatient facility. You need a doctor to supervise it. It's not accessible. We need to come up with systems. And that's where his prolon and his other stuff. And the fact that they can sell it for 500 bucks and have 10,000 offices selling it and make millions of dollars, that's all the better. <laughs> the argument is that you're trying to make it a reachable, accessible, and I don't disagree with any right. of that. I for 95% of the population, they're not coming to a place like this. Right. Our job isn't to prove what's uh, practical. Got our job is to prove what's possible. Okay. Our try is to do, figure out how to get people well, how to keep them well. Somebody else can go to do the marketing stuff and all that. I don't really care. I, I and that's why they say, well, you should yeah. open up a channel. No, I shouldn't open right. up anything. Other people can do that. I don't care. Right. Um, oh, yeah. wh uh, what I'm interested in doing is doing the whole thing people don't get was this wasn't a clinic that, that, that started a research facility. It was the goal was to do a research facility. And we had to do the clinic in order to have a lab to do wow. it in and generate the money. So we've done it exactly that, and we've got what we need to do to do research. So if somebody else can franchise, market, do all that stuff. That's okay. That's great, and I encourage it. I think it's wonderful. No, I, I it's just not what I'm interested. Yeah, in. I don't have any multiple clinics. So it really is only going to be five percent or less of functional medicine. Well, we have one idea services. though that allows the scale. We're going to be doing a project with airline pilots. Our heart study. 
when you take hypertensive airline pilots that can't fly because they need credentials, we can get them back to flying. It's worth a lot of money to the airlines because they spend a lot of money training pilots. There's a shortage of pilots right now. So what we're going to do is go to the hotels that the airlines already have contracts with. Take blocks of 20 rooms in hotels that are underutilized during certain times of the year, so you know redundant capacity rooms. We're going to run a program there, get 20 pilots in there. Pilots can go anywhere because the airlines will fly them anywhere. They don't care. Transportation isn't an issue. We're going to get them well. We'll do a three-week program. We'll embed a doctor. We'll use a local cardiologist. We have a number of cardiologists. We're going to embed a card. We're going to get 20 of these guys back to flying. And then we're going to force the hotels to offer SOS free options on the menu. And now, we were waiting on this. We've got food that, the, that those pilots can use, that they can travel with, to allow them to continue to maintain it so we get good long-term results. Pilots are highly conscientious individuals. They're, they're, the, the airlines will be thrilled because it will cost them essentially nothing. And we'll, and we'll be able to do a study. And the public sees airline pilots as amongst the highest socially rated people, most trust, most not politicians. But airline pods, high trust with it. So if it turns out they can get back to working and it's good enough for them, there's a natural inclination to think, well, maybe it's good enough for the pilots, maybe it's good enough for me. It's not quite as good as athletes. For some reason, people like athletes even more. But pilots are like right there at the top of the pecking order in terms of patient confidence. Right. And so therefore, that's why we picked that, uh, that target. And that is interesting because we could scale that to as many hotel, vacant hotel rooms as there are in areas where, that don't fill up their hotels all year round. So the idea is that could be, you could have 2,000 uh, beds available, you know, at various price points, depending on how fancy the hotels are. So there are, we do have some plans to see it scaled, yeah. but we're not going to be opening up multiple True North Health Center, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the good news is we're going to get much busier, but we prioritize our return people. So when a person that's been here before calls, that's the first thing that we go to. I mean, even to the extent, like, you know, when you fill out those, update those forms, we, it's, it asterisks anybody that's been here before. So we pull all those out and respond to them, and then whatever room we have left, we call people that are new. And you think that's benevolent, but it's not. What it is, is people that have been here before that are coming back aren't easy. They know what they're getting into. There's no, like, what do you mean? I'm not going to eat anything, and oh, <laughs> won't I die? And, you know, they know exactly what they're getting into. And they sure wouldn't come back if they weren't prepared to face, you know, our abuse. And so we've always, and also, you know, ongoing, we're looking at long-term outcomes. Our ultimate study is called the Navigator Study. We're going to enroll 2,000 people for the rest of their lives. And we're going to track those 2,000 people forever. And the samples that we take on them today, we can analyze 10 years from now with tests that don't even exist today. And so the idea is we're trying to figure out not just how to get them well, we think we know that, but how to keep them well. And so whether people comply or not won't matter. Because if you comply and you do well, then we'll be able to demonstrate that. If you don't comply, then we'll be able to say, ah, see, when you don't comply, you get problems and blame you. So either way, it's a win-win situation from a long-term research study. <laughs> the other thing that it'll do is it'll allow those 2,000 people to get the benefits of whatever stuff we come up with in terms of monitoring and support. And then ultimately, we, why did we pick 2,000? That's how many people we can sustain support with this physical plant indefinitely. So eventually, we'll only be treating those 2,000. Okay, which from a doctor's standpoint is cool because that means you have highly motivated, self-selected people that want to get well, and you're not wasting your time on people that are never going to get well because they don't want to make diet and lifestyle changes. So it's kind of a very, dis you know, very tricky. And I don't know if I fully understand. They'd be coming as outpatients every once in a while. Once they're enrolled into this study, they would be. We would be monitoring them forever. And some of them may choose to cycle through. Like we encourage people to do periodic fasting. For maintenance and support, but whatever they do, right. we're going to be the, the trick is we're going to be but trying to provide support and tracking them till they die. Gotcha. And what we're hoping to find is that if you the more you comply with this model that we're laying out, the less stability you have, the longer you live, the better you function. And if not, then we'll tweak the system to match what the data shows. But I'm pretty confident because you know I'm seeing enough people, I'm getting 30 and 35 year follow ups now. And the most common comment is, Yeah, well, everybody's dead. <laughs> Everybody they know. It's like, I don't think it's just coincidental we happen to get lucky and only cherry picked out a few yeah. people that had good genes. You know, we've got a lot of, you know, a lot of these people were sick. You know, they're coming in motivated and they're getting well and now all of a sudden, it almost like there's a connection. But we need to prove it. And that's where, <laughs> that's where research and studies, you really need to do this in a carefully controlled, prospective way and that's what we're going to be trying to do.
you just mentioned the periodic fasting or you know, yes. So if like after leaving here, you follow the SOS, you know, and you do everything. How often would you recommend? So your attending will give you recommendations depending on your situation. What we recommend is for healthy people that are doing everything right, we still recommend every year or two doing a fast of a week. Because if in a fast of a week you're stable, don't get any healing crisis, you're probably okay. What happens though is sometimes you think you're healthy, but you go on a fast, you find out, ooh, not quite so much. And so we think that that's it. In the future, we're gonna be able to do a simple blood test and we'll have non-invasive diagnostic measures and we'll say, oh no, you need to fast. Wow. How long? Seriously? Yeah, you're we don't, or you're no, we will, sure. we will be able to do it. Why are you the, so sure? Because these biomarkers are already exist, it's just nobody's looked at healthy people in fasting and been able to correlate it. That's the kind of correlation we'll be able to do. Many of the, de the stuff's already there. Like for example, we didn't know uh, visceral fat was selectively mobile. We thought it was. Right. The old hygienists have been talking about this for 50 years. But now we actually have a relatively non-invasive way of measuring it. Oh, cool. Well, that's exactly, we got MRI instead of blood. You can get incredible molecular information now that didn't exist even five years ago. We know the patients are getting well. We can see it. Now all we have to do is come up with ways of monitoring it, measuring it, and predicting it. We're able to go retrospectively. We, we, unlike everybody else who's trying to figure out how do you get them well, and they keep trying different things and pills. and No, no, we know. Just do this, and you'll get your blood pressure is going to normal. Now we'll look at the markers. Once you have, I'll give you an example. We believe that compliance is going to relate to personality. So we have a new test. It's, it's the big five personality test. There's a big series of questions you take. It gives you a pretty good validated assessment of what you're, how shy you are, introversion, and extroversion, conscientiousness, et cetera. Well, now they have a validated questionnaire. It's only four to four questions. It correlates well with the big five, big personality profile. We're going to go in and give that to everybody. It doesn't change year to year. You are, it's just like your height doesn't change that much. You might shrink a little bit at the age. Basically, it's the same. So we're going to administer these personality profiles. We're going to go back and identify who had an easy time, were very successful, who really struggled, had a hard time. Take a look at what their personality characteristics are. We know these people are likely to do well with minimum support. These people are going to need extra support. And we're going to eventually figure out what type of extra support will help them be successful. One of the extra supports for some people is just readily available, convenient food. It's just sometimes it's just time. They're just too busy because they got like four kids and they got, you know. Sometimes it's social pressures. So they need better social skills. And what do you do when everybody else is mad at you because you're thin and healthy, you know, and treat you bad? Sometimes it's you live with somebody who's an asshole. How can you manipulate their behavior so they yeah. stop being an asshole? I and mean, no, that's what Dr. Lau does. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Some people are stressed out. They don't need to be stressed out, even if they don't change their life. For example, if you're in, he uses this as an example about how cognitive behavioral therapy can work. If you're in an elevator and you're just minding your own business and somebody behind you starts stabbing you in the back with a sharp stick, you get mad, angry, don't you? And you turn around and you might be like, what the, you know? And then you see, oh, it's a blind person with their cane. Now, you still got to step out of the way because you don't want to get poked, but you aren't angry anymore because you always, oh, they can't help it. They're just trying to figure out where they were in space. You know, that wasn't like they were trying to attack you or do something. So all of a sudden, nothing's changed. You still have a problem there. There's a stick. You got to, you got to do, take an action to, uh, uh, to get out of the way. But the anger and that expensive emotion changes because you understand, oh, that's what's going on. And what he says is many people have stresses in their life, but if they really understand, oh yeah, that asshole, they can't help it because they're, they're doing the best they can. So it doesn't mean you don't have to change your circumstance a little bit, but your, the anger and the, the mental exhaustion sometimes that goes along with it can be modified. You can change the way you relate with people. Um, a, the, a really dramatic example is one of my patients had a mother who was uh, bipolar, just a real nut job, wasn't interested or willing to do anything about it and was really cruel. She would say terrible things, and every time she got together, she just felt awful, but she didn't want to abandon her mother because it's her mother. And so then what, she, what Dr. Lyle helped her do was they just changed how they communicated. They did their communication by written letters. Every day they wrote letters. When the mom wrote letters, she had impulse control. She wouldn't write things, awful things, that she would say because she couldn't control her. And all of a sudden, they were able to communicate. They had a much better relationship. They rarely actually interacted in person. But it satisfied the daughter's need to not be abandoning the mom. Instead, mom was happier because she wasn't doing things that she felt terrible about. And so, you know, life is still difficult, but it wasn't nearly so stressful. Another example, I always think about this one. This is so great. 
woman comes in, she's got trouble with weight. She can't control her eating or whatever. She comes in, loses weight, does great, goes home and immediately gains the weight back. Okay. So then she decides to come back with a, with a friend. Um, and the friend also has eating issues or whatever. So they come in, we're checking them, and this was the old place. And the husband of the first woman comes in. Turns out he's a local physician and insurance, grossly overweight, angry guy, clearly not happy with the whole situation. And he's standing by the door while these two women are checking in. And I thought, oh, I'd go give him a hard time. You know? So I'm you know, going over, trying to poke him a little bit. I said, so you're, it doesn't look like you're too comfortable. <laughs> He goes, I'm fine. I said, hey, you don't look so, so fine. Are you concerned about the, the safety of fasting? He goes, no, I, don't, I know fasting is safe. He said, but quote, these bitches will never eat good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a waste of time. I said, oh, okay. So anyway, he left. So they do their stay. They go home, and she immediately starts getting in trouble again. And then he died. Massive cardiac arrest. And the most amazing coincidence, from the day he died, we've had no more trouble problems. She's been on track, she's been eating well, she's thriving, she lost weight. It was almost like there was a connection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did learn something though. It's like a lot of times it's people's environment, you know, that can be, so that same person, it's whatever emotional scar tissue she had, whatever screwed up childhood, whatever, was all the same. The only thing that changed is her environment had, you know, a 180 pound change, you know. 220 pound change, or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, no problem. So sometimes you gotta change your environment. I had nothing to do with that. That's <laughs> I was thinking, we had a, we, we, when we opened up our kitchen, we had problems with the health department guy. The health department was a grossly overweight guy who came in, gave us a lot of trouble, didn't want to approve our kitchen because we didn't have fire suppression hood or grease trap because we didn't use it. <laughs> Gave us a lot of trouble, came in, surprise inspections, really being a pain in the ass. And then finally he stopped coming in, and it turned out he died. And when Dr. Lau, I said, oh yeah, he said, what about the, because he was coaching me on how to deal with the guy. I said, oh, we don't have to do that anymore, he's dead. He goes, what did you do? <laughs> I said, what did I do? I didn't do anything, he just died. He goes, what did you do? <laughs> Hey, what, is, what do people think about me? Oh, we had the big cop. Yeah, that was funny. We had only opened up here. This is before the cops knew who we were. And so this big guy comes, shows up and he says, I need to talk. Is this person here? I said, you know, what's, what's the deal? And he goes, well, I just need to know, is, are they here? And I said, well, yeah, we have, we have somebody by that name here. He said, well, I need to talk to him. I said, well, what's it all about? He goes, I just need to talk to him. I said, well, I'm not going to take them to you if you don't tell me what, what the deal is. And he said, okay, well, we got a complaint. I said, what's the complaint? He said, they said they're being held against their will by religious cultists and being starved to death so they won't be with Jesus. Oh, my God. I said, look, they're not being held against their will. They're here voluntarily. He says, why? Well, I said, relax. I'll let you talk to him. But first, would you like to have a nice, tall cup of Kool-Aid? <laughs> you said that Dr. Lyle said that was socially inappropriate. Yes. <laughs> and that I'm not to speak to authorities ever again. And I'm thinking it's an obvious right. joke because yeah. Kool Aid's full of sugar. We wouldn't serve it here. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Lyle says when a police officer puts his hand to his hip, that's not a sign he's comfortable. <laughs> but I need to pick up on those body cues. <laughs> you did that when you offered him Kool Aid? Yeah, well, I think that was, it was some years ago. It was yeah. not long after Jim Jones, yeah. and, you know, this sounded like oh, that. Wow. Now fasting is not quite so controversial, you know what I mean? It's People so have heard about it. Back then, like, you know, it was like, you know, when they got a complaint that somebody's being starved to go to be with Jesus, they thought, well, maybe they're being starved to go to be with Jesus. You know, so anyway, he has to investigate. So. Sounds mm -hmm. like there's more of that story, but how, how did that well, it actually worked out okay. It turns out, you know, I play basketball with a lot of cops, and so they, a lot of them know me, so now it's fine. No more cops. Yeah, worked out fine. He talked to the patient. The patient was fine. Yeah, we had the cops come one other time. We had a patient here who had uh, really serious problems from uh, esophageal adhe um, adhesions, uh, where he couldn't swallow even water, and it was pretty bad. And so, uh, and he was an alcoholic, older guy, in a wheelchair. And so the son brought him in, 
and we worked with the local gastroenterologist to do some dilations during fasting, and it worked. And the gastroenterologist was amazed because he said he didn't think it would work, but it did. Combination of fasting and him going in and expanding the area. Now the guy can swallow, he was able to eat, it was like a miracle. And of course, he wasn't drinking because you know, he's here. And so then, once he's better, <clears throat> he took his wheelchair and he rolled himself over to the, to the uh, Pacific market to get himself some booze. And he came back with a, you know, uh, what's the white stuff, the vodka, right? He came back with a pint of vodka. And, um, and his son came into the room and said, what the hell is this, Dad? And he goes, oh, no, I'm better now. <laughs> he said, no, you can't, you can't, you're not better now. You just, you, no, no, I can swallow now. It's okay. You know, it's like, and so um, he, the son took the, the vodka away, and he took his wallet away, so he didn't have any money. And so the old guy called the cops. Aww. And the cops show up and said, what's the problem? And he said, he took my wallet away and my vodka away. And he said, well, why did he do that? He said, well, he doesn't want me to drink because I was an alcoholic and I got um, aclasia, which is the name of the condition. But now I'm better. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said to the son, is that true? Yeah, that's true. And then he said, okay. And so and then the old man said, aren't you going to make him give me back my wallet and my booze? He goes, what, are you crazy? No. <laughs> he left. And that was it. And then the old man said, okay. He just accepted it. It was fine. But I mean, from his viewpoint, yes, he had to stop drinking because he had this disease. But now that he's better, he should, you know. Mm. Uh, how long, much longer did he stay? Um, actually, he transferred to a facility. Oh, I can tell you one other story. Which is good. He transferred to a senior housing type place where I think he's too far away from the booze. Um, this was great. This is one of my favorite uh, stories. We had a guy with multiple sclerosis who was wheelchair bound and had developed uh, dementia. And they wanted to put him in a nursing home but his neighbor knew he didn't want to go into a nursing home. And the guy was quite wealthy, he had a lot of real estate, lots of resources. And so the neighbor brought him here, but he was kind of out of it. He couldn't really, didn't really know what was going on too much. And we did an examination of him, and it turned out he had a bladder infection. And a lot of times when people develop an infection, they lose cognitive ability to draw the edge. And so what we did, ironically, is we gave him antibiotics. We treated his acute infection with drugs, and he woke up. Okay? And so once we got it under control and we started doing the diet and stuff, so anyway, meanwhile, his kids, who he had two uh, drug addict kids, who had heard that he was, had, had gone, had become demented, and had been brought to this place. So they called me up really upset. They don't want him here, they want him in a nursing home, and because what they wanted to do was get his assets, sell his properties, and get his money to feed their drug habits and whatever. whatever. And um, so anyway, the dad now is perfectly alert. And we said, oh, your kids are upset. Okay, don't, you know, I understand. Don't worry about that. And uh, so meanwhile, the kids come to get him. And he doesn't say anything. He's in his wheelchair, right? And the kids are rambling on and being really rude and inappropriate. And course, meanwhile, he's just sitting in the chair. They think he's still demented. And then finally, after a few minutes, he'd heard enough. And he said, let me tell you how it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Sent the kids away, got an attorney, set up a trust, got him into a nice place back east. And, uh, you know, it was great. Those, those kids were like, because they thought he was just out of it. It was like, great. <laughs> I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. But the ironic thing was, he went to the holistic health place, and what, what, how did they treat him? With drugs. You know, that's why. It was mostly because he was getting lousy medical care. That was the bottom line. If proper medical treatment would have identified the infection. And, and that was Dr. Sultana, who's like, yeah. Is he right. still here, Dr. Sultana? Oh, yeah. He's on vacation. He'll be back oh. from, uh, Tuesday, the 4th. Saturday. Saturday. Or Friday. Or, anyway, he's, he'll, Friday. He's, he'll be back in town in a few days. He okay. just went, he took his family back east for holiday. He's one of those doctors, like, every year wants to take, like, a week off. <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> But he's so good, we just accommodate him. Yeah. Not everybody's like you. Thank goodness. Okay, is there anything else? Okay, we're done.